Okay, let's go ahead and get ourselves started with session 12 of 120C to 20C. Today we're going to uh, continue looking at using uh, advanced nodes to go through and do our analysis. We're going to keep on looking at the solar analysis node. But we're going to push ahead into kind of a very important and empowering thing that you can do in Dynamo and FC is something called a list map to start doing exhaustive testing where as opposed to just analyzing, analyzing a single case, you analyze multiple cases and vary the input values and get the results of the analysis and then pair those input values up with the results and ultimately try to figure out you know, where the optimum might be. So what we're going to be doing today is what very much in support of what uh, is going on in the assignment. Oh, in terms of what is happening overall, let's go ahead and in terms of, oh, if you weren't here the other day, let's think about the whole issue of software updates. Um, on your machines, which should probably get you updated to Dynamo 1.0, it updated just the other day, so if you haven't updated it yet, um, when you open Dynamo, you'll see a little green cloud thing over in the upper right hand corner of the Dynamo window. Go ahead and click that and download that and get yourself installed. If you're on these machines and it's not installed on your machine, log in, or actually you can start the whole Dynamo upload, but when it asks you for a username and password to um, make those changes administratively, go ahead and type in the incredibly super secret name and password to go through and put the administrative stuff in there. Okay, so you should be good on that side. In terms of solar analysis, uh, there was a solar analysis for Dynamo package. It was just updated at the end of April. So if you are working on a different machine today, you might need to update that again. What we'll do is basically go through and uninstall the old solar analysis package and reinstall the new solar analysis package. So if you're already on the same machine as last time, you should be in pretty good shape. But if solar analysis starts bogging down on you, it's probably something about the version. It on the web service. Okay. As an overview of what we're doing today, let me show you where it exists in the assignment and sort of set the stage by looking at that. Because it's actually explained right down here. The idea is you're going to go through and use the solar anal analysis package to compute more accurate evaluations for your structure, whatever the structure may be. Then in step two for three units is basically try varying your input parameters to find the values that maximize the solar insulation. Okay, set the input parameters to optimal values and provide some visual feedback for what you think you know, the optimal values would be. For three units up to step two there, you're pretty much just tweaking the input sliders and trying to see what you think feels good. You know, based on like you're just hunting and pecking and trying to sort of see what the different results might be. And for four units, this is where we're going today, is we'll actually use a list map node to quickly evaluate a whole range of input parameters. So this is where we go very systematic, as opposed to just doing it in a very high level, high level way. Manually uh, vary your input uh, parameters and consider the visual feedback. Uh, well, manually doing it can give you sort of uh, some visual feedback to help guide you. It's sort of hit or miss. A list map, you know, to vary the most influential input parameter, then exhaustively test a range of input values to find the one that maximizes the solar insulation. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to go through and just construct a list map and a whole bunch of input values and see how you need to update a Reddit model and get the analysis values out so that you can go through and ultimately find the optimal value. Okay. So once you go through and find, using the list map, a whole range of values, you're going to go ahead and try and find either the max or the min, whatever it is you're looking for. In our case, it's probably going to be a maximum. Okay. And then ultimately set the input parameter to that value. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. That's sort of where we're going today. How we are going to get there is we're actually going to start with the same example we looked at last time, the whole little solar roof. You might remember last time where we had started was we looked at the whole solar shade, the solar overhang thing, and thought about a way to optimize the overhang design, uh, just kind of based on the sun's position. It was interesting, that same afternoon, I was working with one of the PBL teams, that class we were talking about, and their strategy was basically to go through and reposition sun shades so that during the winter time, the shade would be open, so you'd always get sort of the maximum uh, sunlight in to help heat the building. In the summertime, they wanted to basically swing the shade shut 
so that you would block out the light and not add to the, heat, uh, the heating loop or the cooling loop. Excuse me. So it was weird that you know we did something just very very similar to it, just like uh, moments later, you know, for the PVL students. It really is kind of a good thing when you think about having dynamic window elements that can sort of adapt and adjust based on what the sun's position is. So you really can pretty rapidly start changing uh, the heating and cooling loads. Okay. We looked at the whole idea of doing solar analysis for a sloping roof and how we can use that node to compute some values. We pretty much did it for a single kind of value of the slope. And here's where we're going today. We're going to keep on using that whole solar analysis node so we can get the better evaluation values. But what we're going to do is we're going to start by adding an input so we just change the roof slope. Okay. That works out pretty easy. We're then going to update the Revit model element, so do a little set element parameters to go through by name to use that. Okay. But what we're going to find out is that we actually have to make sure before we do the evaluation that the Revit element is updated. And here's kind of the funny issue that we're really at, at the heart of a lot of what we're going to do here. As we're going to go through and evaluate Revit elements and change those Revit elements, it's quite possible for the scripting to get ahead of the change in Revit. So if you change an input value, and then you want to evaluate the updated Revit element, okay, you actually have to sort of say pause and wait and refresh the Revit element before we do the evaluation. Because otherwise, the scripting is so fast, it just evaluates it before Revit gets a chance to update. And then you don't really get any change in the values. So, we're going to use a little system called adding transaction starts and stops to update the Revit element and make sure that it is updated before we go through and do the evaluation. Next, we're going to go ahead and make sure that we're selecting the updated roof surface. Okay, so we need to make sure that it's actually the one that's been changed. So analyze that. We're going to go through and say, hey, for this updated roof surface, you know, what's an overall evaluation that's appropriate for the input value that we put in there? Once we have basically the logic set so that we can connect between an input value and an evaluation, we can say, great, let's now create a custom node that will really have an input on the front end to go ahead and change the value and an output, which is the evaluation. And then we'll use something called the list map to vary the input values, getting a whole range of output values, and put those together in a data table and then you can export to Excel. So that's the overview. A lot of little steps, but it's actually very logical and kind of systematic as we go through. So, if you can, please go ahead and open up. Oh, in Revit, go for 12.1. Let's get that solar analysis for the sloping roof. There's really nothing all that incredibly you know, interesting about this style. The element that we're selecting, though, is a mass element that has this input parameter that lets us change things. So all these masses over here are just kind of rectangular masses. So if you want to have some fun and play around with the analysis, you can go through and just oh, you know, push and pull these, make them taller or shorter. If you want to have more shade on the structure, I see a bigger you know, impact in terms of what the solar insulation might be. You feel free to go through and change those. On um, this element, though, the real key sort of variables we have to, uh, or inputs we have to change are either roof slope. So you can try changing that. Right now it's about 30. But if you get it all the way down to zero, the roof will be flat. I am pretty certain it'll break at 90, so I wouldn't go to 90. I'm going to say 85. <laughs> that doesn't look like 85, though. Let me take a look at this in terms of uh, there might be something weird about the way I've defined this thing. Looks like it's stopping at like 45. Interesting. Let me go ahead and take a look at the uh, actual object itself. <coughs> you 
you can choose it and say edit the family. Here's where it's basically coming together. If I go through and change some of these values. So let's change that to 45 just to kind of see what happens. That looks pretty good. Let's change it to 60. That looks pretty good. Change it to 75. Well, that's interesting. My calculation, it's, it's funny, it is making a change. I think my, what I'm calling roof slope is not actually truly the angle, because as you know, I can see right now that it's, it's not working the way it should. If I wanted to go through and redefine it, let's think about that. It's okay, this will work in terms of just sort of changing that value, but it looks like I don't have the right thing. I should be having the top of it over there, building width, building length, roof slope. Lower area, roof base height, that's there. Roof ridge height, that's the part where I'm sort of computing something. Let's see if you can really even find that formula right now. It's at 100. But there's a formula somewhere here that's actually relating all those things together. And I would sort of expect there to be, oh, some sort of sign. Roof base height, roof ridge height, there it is, is the building width. The sign of the roof slope. Oh, roof base height plus it's not the building width. What is is the building width times the sign? Okay, so if it is, let me think about this. I want the sign. That's the sign value right there. But it's really the sign value of that. And it's the sign of. Yeah, it should be in terms of the height. The sign value there. I'm, I'm goofing right there. Not right there. It be building good. Okay, I'll do this. Base height I got. I have the angle right here. I want to go through and say it's the sign of the angle. That's the height over there. That is, I guess it should be the building width. So I'm not sure. It says 159. Although over here, ah, it should be at 159. So why is it only saying at 100? There's something interesting going on there. Might be something about the way the whole thing is bounded or limited or something like that. Because it looks like the calculation is doing the right thing. It looks like it's just not being completely accurate about that. Did you make this mass? Or did yes. You upload it? Okay. But again, as I make masses, I'm certainly prone to make mistakes. Oh, there it is. No, it actually says it's there. But it's kind of funny. Somehow that doesn't seem right. My formula is off somewhere. So if anyone can kind of figure out where my formula's off, I would think it would be the width of the building times the sign value. This is recalculated. See so if anyone can figure out where my math is going wrong. Okay, so I think I got it. You got it? X so equal, you want x equal, what do you call this, building width? You want you got base height plus tangent of theta times building width. That's what you want. So say it again. You want base height, yep. which is your little one, yep. mm -hmm. plus, plus building width, yep. the bottom one, times the tangent of theta. The tangent, tangent of that. Tangent. Thank you. Um, that actually sort of sounds a little bit better. Let's see if we can make that work. It's just tangent. There's a tangent in here, huh? That's why. That's my guess. Okay. That's looking a little bit better. Check that out. Nothing like a new, improved kind of part. Okay, that's much better. Okay, so if I say over here that it's closer to 45, that looks good. If I say it's like 60. That's looking good. Excellent. OK, so if you want to go through and change that, uh, here's how we do it. Let me say OK here. I'm going to load this back into the project. Okay. And we will go through and overwrite that. That's looking a little bit better. How you change it, if you want to change it too, is go through and select the element. <coughs> say edit the family. 
You'll get back to the mass that's behind it all. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. No problem. Sometimes my late night math skills get a little rough. <laughs> okay, and what I'll do is, when I have that little element open, I can go to, this is where you change the parameters. And right in here where it says roof ridge height, that's where the formula is. Roof base height plus, build time, plus building width times. And I had sine in there, and it looks like we want tangent in there. See if you can update that. Let's well, we get an example that works. As long as we're going to all this work, we might as well get one that actually has an accurate reading here. Okay, so if you have that in there, go ahead and say okay. You can test it just by putting a value in here and see if it looks like 45 or 60 degrees. Try putting 45 in there and say apply. Try putting 60 in there, 75 in there, and apply. Okay, at 90, we're gonna get ourselves in trouble because it'll go infinite. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Pop that back over here. And when you're done with that, say load it into your project and close. Actually, I do want to change that or save that. And override it over here. So again, test it over here. In terms of the many things to check and verify, always sort of try the manual things in Revit just to sort of see if that's giving you a sensible result. Because if not, you just sort of get lost in the math. So go for your intuition first. Okay, looking pretty good. So with that new improved one, I'll save that away just so we have it. Let's think about what we're going to do. The idea is what I want to do is take that example and add an input variable so I can go through and just change the value of loop slope. You'll see it's a parameter, it's an instance parameter. I want to basically set the instance parameter by name and actually pick up whatever value I want to have plugged into there. So if you go on over to Dynamo, let's think about how you're going to do this. What you're going to do is we're going to need to select that element. So not just the face, we're going to actually have to select the element so that we can get the list of the input parameters for the element. And then we can say element set parameter by name and go ahead and slide that in there. So, if you want to, let's go on over to Dynamo and you open up uh, part two. If you want to start from scratch, just open step one. If you want to have the basic nodes in place and just connect them together, go to step two, A, and we can just uh, drag them all together. Save yourself some typing. So let's let Dynamo open. Slowly but surely, a little too slowly, and not surely enough. So if I updated my Dynamo yesterday, but now it's showing up as 0.9? Yes. How do I fix that? Because the green thing isn't showing up anymore. Ah, no worries. Um, what you can do is just if you go to dynamobim.org, you can download it from there. So the question is, if it's not showing up for you here, actually, there's probably at a button out here somewhere in terms of discussion forms. Let's see if there's something in here. Go to the project website, go to the project wiki. Let's see if that'll actually get you there quicker. And that's the actual, that's interesting, that's the Dynamo project. That's actually the core behind it all. It's dynamobim.org is the place and you come up and hit download up here, it should take you to a page where you can download that. And again, you want to always download the version which is the, uh, the one that installs in Revit. There's a separate thing called Dynamo Studio, okay, but we actually want the one that's actually in Revit. Looks like it's still slowly but surely kind of working away here. For what we're doing today, you're probably okay. But I like to get things updated as quickly as we can. 
Okay. Maybe, are mostly okay in terms of the versions? Okay, great. So hang tight and you'll catch back up on 2B. Something like that. That'll actually work. So let's go ahead and open. I'm going to go out and grab this 2A. And in 2A, you'll see that it looks an awful lot like where we left off last time. Okay. But we've added just a few sort of nodes over in the upper left-hand corner. Let's see if we can get those up on the screen. Okay, so most of what you're looking at on the screen is actually very familiar. This is kind of where we were last time in terms of selecting some surfaces, some shading surfaces, and plugging over to the solar radiation analysis node. Okay, up here in the corner though, we've added just a few things to the graph. And if you go on over here and focus for just a second, you'll see what we're gonna do is basically start by selecting a model element. Let me zoom on in there a little bit. So what we're going to do is just select the model element. If it isn't already selected, you're going to say change. Go over to Revit. And now I can select that element. I actually want the one that has the uh, little slopey roof. That's the element I'm interested in changing. successful, you should go through and get a number over here. For me, it's element 316449. I bet it's probably for you, because I think it stores it as part of the file. So we have the element. We basically want to say element set parameter by name. We're going to have a value for the roof slope anywhere from, oh, I think I said it from 5 to 85. Pull that in and the parameter name. And that should let us just sort of uh, vary that roof slope. So go ahead and give it a try. We'll say element. Parameter name is just roof slope. The value is over here. Okay, so you can give that a try. Let me go ahead and just run it at five for a, for a moment. You'll see that I'll go through and run it at five. What should happen is it's running the whole script, so it's doing the analysis too. But if any luck, this popped on down to about a five degree slope. Okay. But if we go on now and look at what's happening over here, you'll see that surface still looks like, hey, that doesn't look like five degrees. Okay. And if we change it to some other values and run it, you'll see that it doesn't really have much of an effect. Let's try this. Let's try changing it to 60 degrees and run that. What's going to happen is... Oh, now it's five. It's always like one step behind us. And the reason is it rushes ahead. Basically what happens is we're off doing this, but it says, oh, hey, I can start over here. And it just starts over here selecting the surface to analyze. So we got to figure out a way to gate those things so that you can't actually go ahead until you actually make the change up here. Okay, so that part up here, this is actually pretty good. This is just setting the parameter value by name. We're in pretty good shape. The way to do this in terms of thinking about gating things is there's this notion in uh, Revit of a transaction start and a transaction end. And what that's all about is transaction start says, I'm going to start changing some different things. And as soon as I say transaction end, regenerate the Revit model. Okay, and then let things move forward. So it basically forces a regen. Okay, so what the transaction is useful for is you could basically change a whole bunch of things and not regenerate all of them independently. You could sort of put a bunch of different input values, then say regenerate, and then move forward. So we're going to do a little transaction start and transaction end on either end of this over here. Okay, 
But then what we're going to have to do is just sort of change our logic around this a little bit because you know, that's going to update the model, okay, but we still want the model to wait on the fact that the regeneration end finished. Okay, but let's deal with the regeneration first. So this part actually works out pretty straightforward. There's a function called transaction start and transaction end. Here's the start. Oops. Put that over here. Get rid of that one over there. I got an extra. I'm going to say, let's do the transaction end. Now, these are actually pretty straightforward about what happens. Basically, you can throw any element you want in there, and what's going to happen is it'll basically pause on the regeneration until you say transaction in. But generally what I try to do is pass an element through so that the element that needs to be changed, the element that will be changing, is the one that passes out. That way, you know, before I can use that element, I have to make sure the transaction in is completed. So what that would look like is something like this. I'd say I got my element. I'm going to do a transaction start on it then change the element, and then transaction end it. Okay. So all that is really just about going through and making sure that before we use the element, it actually has gone through and updated itself to use the new value of the root slope. Okay, so that's actually not too bad. If you want to, you can go through and I'll just make a little group over here just because it's gonna get kind of confusing it a little bit. We can say create a group and, oh, this is the group where I'm gonna say that what I'm doing is just updating the Revit element. Okay, so, so far so good. Let's just kind of review where we are in the big picture. In the big picture, we've added an input for the roof slope. Check. We've updated the rivet model element. Check. Now we need to make sure that we're selecting the updated roof surface. And this is where a little hocus pocus happens. Because here's what we got to do. Back over here, you're saying, OK, well, I got that surface. I'm picking a surface over here to analyze. OK, that's pretty good. The problem is that's the original surface. That's not the updated surface. OK, so we're going to do something that basically pulls off the element over here. Okay? And you might imagine there is a nice function that will help you get the surfaces. So let's go ahead and see. This element, I think it's just surface. Oh, where'd it go? I'll just try. I'm so bad about remembering which ones are which. Poly surface closed. That returns the list of surfaces. That's from a poly surface. Join surfaces. I'm going to find it here in a second. I'm very bad about remembering these things because there's too many of them. Okay, element surface again because I think it's in there somewhere. Rotation, divide the surface. I got all that type stuff. Going ahead and looking at the next one. Okay. 
Opening, opening, opening. I think it's been a long time to open today. Hey. Oh, I should stop. That's just updating the rip model. It's 4A. If anyone's opening to 4A, just go ahead and like uh, tell me which one it is. We can connect it back together pretty quickly. I'll see if I can do it. All right, see if you can beat me. Yep, I'm up. Um, what is it? it called? Element.setstream. Wait, no. <laughs> it's right after transaction. Oh, right. transact element dot faces. Faces. Okay. Okay. Why not? It's we're gonna get the faces of the element, not the surfaces. Okay. Well, the faces are surfaces. Okay. So what we're gonna do is start by basically going through and just getting some faces. Let's let that open up on mine since I'm already partly started there. But here's the deal: when we go through and get the faces, you're gonna find out that there's actually six different faces. Okay, so we have six different faces, and we're going to have to do a little magic to figure out which is the roof surface. Okay, but that's not actually too bad, because you can use a little math to figure that out. That's a good way to do it. Actually, what I was going for, the lower surface, the Z points down into the ground. That's a negative. The ones on the sides all point just at Z0. So I started out just saying that I'm going to go through and basically compute the surface normals to them. And then it's based on the normal values of the Zs. And I was going to look for anything that was greater than 0. Why is the roof the only one with the Z greater than 0? Ah, because what ends up happening for the other faces, the normals point down or they point out. They're pointing oh, out yeah, from it. Yeah. Okay, okay. So the vertical surfaces are all pointing out. On the side. Yeah, so that one's Z is zero. Okay. Yeah. The down one, the, the floor, has a Z of minus one. So it's going to have some sort of a positive value. We know that it's going to be you know, greater than zero. We're not sure exactly if it was perfectly flat, it would be Z of one. Depending on the amount of slopiness, it might be less than that. But basically, we're going to grab those spaces. We're going to say, let's do a normal at the, I'm just putting it at the 0 0.5, 0 0.5 point, which is sort of the middle of the surface. And then saying, what is the z value? But let's just kind of connect that together so you can sort of see. If I go through and just run it as is, we'll start with just the issue of the surfaces. And you'll see I actually get these six different surfaces. Let's let that finish. Okay, so I got this list. I got six different surfaces. I'm not really sure which one it is because it's not necessarily the first one in the list. You'd like it to be, but it's not. So I'm going to need to go through and do surface normals. If I do surface normals and go through and run the surface normals, you're going to see it's going to give us all these different values. Here's all these different vectors. And you can kind of check out the z values. The z values look like they're going anywhere from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, then 0 0.996, and then minus 1. Okay? So this sounds pretty good. I should be able to say z is greater than 0 and probably get it. However, when I did that, it actually returned 2. And it's only because of rounding errors, or something like that. It was actually taking one of the other ones and returning it. But if you come over here and we say normal vector dot z, that's going to take these and get the z component okay, greater than either 0 or 0.01, which is my little way of getting around the rounding error. Okay, that's going to give us a list of trues and falses. So let's try that, because with a list of trues or falses, then we can figure out which surface or identify which surface is the one that we consider to be the roof. Okay, so here I am, I'm hanging out over here. I got a bunch of trues and falses. So what this is telling me is it's that fourth one, the zero through fourth, right there, the fourth one that's true. That's the one that has the positive Z. Okay, 
So what I can do is take my list of faces and these trues and falses and use the filter by Boolean mask where we take the list, we take this list as the mask, and then we want to basically grab the in ones, the true ones. So it's kind of a good general principle. And as we go through and we start varying forms, we often get into this of basically having to grab all the faces and figure out what is the face of interest, because it can't just be the one that you explicitly chose anymore. So I'll say list. I'll say mask. Okay, and at this point, if I go through and watch those, you see I should get one in and five out. Try that. Super. Now, that is actually the trickiest thing we're going to do today. It's just this funny thing about the math and trying to figure that out. So if you're feeling good about that, you're going to be in great shape. Because what we are going to do now is just basically say, hey, OK, we got a surface. we got a single surface over there. Let's go ahead and analyze that surface. So don't analyze this surface anymore. Go ahead and analyze that surface, because that surface is always going to be up to date. So. Are yes. You, are U and V always defined from zero to one along the surface? Is it good? Like U and V, they're always defined from zero to one along the surfaces? Or? Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah, so for any surface, one corner, and it's a little unclear what corner it is sometimes, one's always zero, zero, one's one, one. Okay. So, and then it'll just, depending on whatever curvaceous surface you put in there, it'll always put, that's just giving you only the, the midpoint. You either look very concerned or you're about to ask a question. Oh, no, I'm just, just what is that list filter? Like it's Max? list filter by Boolean mask. Yeah. Is there a way to just return the one with the maximum Z coordinate? Like, from, that seems like you could do this in one. Let's think if you could. You could, let's think about because that. Because this, this would help if you have sloped walls, because some architects are crazy. Yeah, so let's try this. Mm -hmm. Okay, a very good question. Right, Jenna? Some architects like to do slope walls. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know who he's talking about. <laughs> Let's say normal.z. Let's just go for that, or vector.z. And we'll try this. I'll show you another construct that actually works very well, too. So these are now just going to be all not the greater than ones. Yeah. It's just the uh, values. OK. And from this list, we could actually say list.max. Ah, that's right. And then will that return the, will that return the max value? Or It'll return the, max. Return the index of it's, the max. It's, well, that's the next step. OK, so we go through and pull that. Oh, hang on. Um, I did that as a code block. That's not what I want. Maximum item. I see the other thing I want. It's actually sitting right there that we're going to need in just a second here. Where did my max go? There it is. So, following Jordan's example, I'm going to pull this out over here, going to get the maximum item, it's going to get something like 0.996. Beautiful. Okay, here's the deal. What Jordan would like to do is take that 0.996 value and say, hey, which face did that belong to? Okay, and then use that face. And the function for actually doing that is right down here. Now, for me, it's there because I have loaded a package called Clockwork. Okay, if you don't have Clockwork, we're going to have you load down with that one. It's the other most useful package to do. There's, actually, there's my three favorite packages are the Lunchbox, Clockwork, and then like you know, Zach's Quads from Rectangular Grid. Those are like three essentials. You need to have them on all your machines. If you don't have Clockwork, let me just show you how it works. You can, you can download Clockwork. Again, just under Packages, search for Clockwork. But this function works like this. And I always, again, have to sort of remember, oh, the, oh, 
gives you such uh, useful sort of things to figure out here in terms of uh, like which one's which. Okay. I think that basically what you're going to do is, oh, I was have to remember this. You basically give it the list, the values you want to match out of, and then what you want to pull out of it still. So I think what this is going to be is, and I'll somehow mess this up in terms of, there's only three inputs, but I'm going to watch, I'm going to get it all wrong in terms of what it is. I think that it's basically, I'm going to give it the list of faces, okay? I'm going to give it the list of values, okay? Then I'm going to give it that one as, the, actually, I think it's the other way. I think these are going to be the list of keys, and that's the value I want to try and find. Okay, so let's see if that actually works. Um, it's uh, yeah, that'd be fine for that. Looks like I have all five of them there, so that's not it. Let me try it the other way. Because if it's then, because I always get the sense of this backwards in terms of what it should be. Let's try those as the keys. And those are the values to match. Let's try that. List. Okay, I'm getting them all, values, keys, sequence. I just have the order wrong. Let's see if we can actually come up with a, the actual help that sort of describes how this function works. I want that to be the list of surfaces. Those are the keys. I think of it that way. Not very helpful there. Let's see if it says anything over here that's helpful to us. So matches a list with a given set of keys and returns the values corresponding to the keys. Matches a list with a given set of keys and returns the values corresponding to the keys. The keys should be the maximum value. Let's try just the sequence and the values. Let me try bringing those in as the values and uh, the sequence. returning one surface in there. Okay. So basically what it's doing in here is matching, it's basically saying uh, like that surface is surface number four in the list, that's the only one that sort of matched that. Okay. So let's go ahead and back over here. Let's watch that on this side. Second one over here, let's remove that. Come over here, I'll just watch that. Show that for a second. Is that still there? I'm still, I'm, I'm backwards a little somewhere in here in terms of uh, thinking about this, because it's really, you know, I just want the single surface out of there. I can say list not empty, but I think it's actually that I have something kind of flipped around in here. So I want that to actually sort of have a little help to give us some guidance about which thing pops into which. Could you use like index of it's and then put in the list? So you want to take your you want to take your maximum and give it put it sequence and then the normal vector disease, the keys. And that faces the values and that returns one. Oh. oh. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's get this right. Although index of set it pretty good too. Okay, so sequence is, that's the sequence of items, values to match. Okay, that's the one. Okay, next up. And the keys are the list of values to match against. It's the, it's the, the z vectors. Okay, and then the values is the master list. 
The values is the list of faces, yeah. Okay. Great, that's a single circle. Okay, thank you. That's super unintuitive based on those names. <laughs> exactly. There's no, there's no way that I would do that. I would know how to do that without. Okay. If you want to, because you're such good uh, folks who know how to do this, you can go through and let's see if we can edit the custom node. I would change the name. What's the first one? The, 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 first, the first one is that's the list of values to test. That's the it's values. The yeah, okay. That's, no, that's yeah, that's the list of values, right? So that's what you values want to test. Values to be matched. Yeah. Okay. Next up is the keys. These are the values to be matched against. Or key. Keys to match against. And this is list of items that have these keys. <laughs> I'm not proud. It's an open source world, so uh, if that helps you, go through and change them to make them a little more useful to you. So the values to be matched, you only have that single maximum. The keys to match against, okay, that's the list of all the things we're going to try and match that item against. Then these are the items to select from that we're going to pull the matching one out. OK, that's just a, basically a lookup. So either one of those would work. The nice thing about kind of Jordan's uh, thing over here is it'll uniquely get the one that's the maximum. Um, you can actually play all sorts of things. We can put all sorts of different criteria, and we could evaluate two or three different surfaces if we want to, just based on whatever the criteria is, whether it's a single max or the top two or whatever it is that you have in there. So the good news is somehow we're just going to have to go out and get the surfaces. But the nice thing is this is always going to get the right surfaces, so and it's going to wait to update uh, what's happening over here in Reddit before it gives us those surfaces. Okay, so let's pause there for a sec. Is that sort of feeling pretty good? Yes? When you made the original mass, you, you talked about this a few weeks ago, how it knew that the normal line to it was going to be negative for the floor and mm -hmm. positive for the roof. Mm -hmm. If I go and draw a mass, mm -hmm. will it also know that automatically, or what do I need to keep in mind? I think that when I create a mass within a Revit family, it sort of has this notion of the middle and going outwards from okay, it. Okay, so it finds that yeah. part. Mm -hmm. However, you know, when we do it mathematically, we do it in Dynamo, then we create a surface by locking things together. Yep. Then it's a little fuzzier about which way it goes. Okay. So there's always a little bit of testing. That's you know, one of the things to always watch out for is you know, you're never quite sure which, which way the negative and the positive is. Okay, so definitely a little testing to do that. Okay. Now that we have our surface, either by Boolean filtering or just by going by the max, either way, let's just go ahead and take that surface on down and we'll pop it in as the analysis surface. And that way it'll always be accurate. So if I go through and I'll do the maximum one, let's do that. And I will grab this over here and just take it as my analysis surface. Okay. Notice now I'm no longer using the one that's kind of hanging out over there somewhere. Let's go ahead and test some values. Now, it's a little bit interesting about the whole issue of updating that image in there and see whether it actually works or not. Yeah. What happened for me is at this point, when I started changing the values, I was no longer getting color coding in here. I don't have to worry about that because how that function is working is really less important than the numbers that are being returned over here. But my intuition would say that if I'm using that as a surface over there, what I should probably do is also take it and use it as the surface that I'm going to apply the color coding to. Okay, but to be honest, for me, it just sort of stopped working. Yeah. But I won't worry too much. Yeah, it still doesn't. 
it's like it sort of doesn't understand the association anymore about which surface to go through and colorize. But again, we're not going to worry too much. OK, so this is what we want to test now. We want to say that, hey, we have basically some input values. Let's go on over here. For example, right now my input value is a whopping five degrees. And if I look at my cumulative values down over here, they start with, oh, 235, 655. Maybe these are the cumulative versus the average versus the peak values. But this is for five degrees. Let's go ahead and try changing it to something like 45 degrees and just make sure those things are changing. So I can change it to 45 degrees. Where did it go? Input's way back over here. Now, this is very clunky right now, but we're going to make it a lot cleaner in just a few minutes. I'll run that. We'll come on over here. It's 221, 471. OK, so there is some change. Things seem to be changing a little bit. But let's talk about what we're going to do now. Because we are going through, and we still have, we're analyzing the surface for different things. That kind of makes sense. But we would really like to go through and come up with not a whole range of values. This is a whole matrix. So that's it's based on a 4 by 4 grid, all these values being returned across the entire face. It's interesting. You know, what's going to happen there? Oh, it's a, oh I'm going to see there's actually a, there's an error in the way I sort of try to do this. Because what's going to happen is, yeah, I'm going to basically come up with an evaluation. What's going to happen? Actually, I guess that's true. If it's power, you're actually getting more room surface. Think about this is we need to kind of like uh, come up with a, another way of doing this. But anyway, right, we'll do it the way we're doing it first. I'm thinking ahead to a problem I already foresee. Um, as this thing slopes on up, basically what I want to do is basically just add up all the insulation that was available to us. So these are the insulation at all the different points. These are on a four by four grid. So I said, hey, what if I actually took all those points and just sort of multiplied all those by four by four so I can get sort of a total insulation? So it's the amount for the area, and then divide it, or multiply it by the area, and kind of do that. Come up with a single evaluation. So let's think about what that would look like. Oops. So what we're going to do is just take all those values, and we're going to something a little bit different to them. Oh, for my purposes right now, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of this because I'm not really using that anymore. If you are sort of a little behind in terms of where the scripting is right now, where we are is we just finished step five. We're just entering into step six. So if you want to jump back in, jump back in with 6A. That'll sort of start you out to where we're going to be. So here's the idea. I got all these different values, and these different values we're looking fine, but it's kind of hard just looking at the big old list to get an overall sense of how what we're doing. So I said, hey, well, what if we just went ahead and added all those together and then multiply it by the area? So I put together a little function that did something like this. First, I want to get that list of numbers. Now, this list of numbers, you might notice, actually is buried two levels deep in the hierarchy. That's because it's sort of in a grid. Okay, So it's a grid of points. So if I just want to get a list of numbers, what I can do is say list.flatten. And I'm going to say, let's go ahead and grab that list of numbers. And just go ahead and flatten it by, in this case, I'm going to flatten it by two, just because there's two levels of hierarchy in there. And again, I'll always check, because I usually get it wrong, to make sure that that's just a flat list of numbers. So run completed. 
That's just a list of all those different insulation values at all those different grid points. So my idea was, hey, let's go ahead and take basically the grid spacing and just say these values times spacing times spacing to go through and figure out the total insulation. So I can take these over here. I'm just going to go through and create a little code block. I'm going to say my total insulation at a point okay, times just cumulative insulation. The grid spacing times the grid spacing. So what that's going to let us do is just grab these insulation values. And they pull my spacing across. Okay, so it's going to multiply them by 16, basically, and give me just a whole series of numbers that have been factored up by the spacing. Now, what I want to do is just do a total on that. So I'll do a list sum, which is a math sum. now going to give me is just a total number. So you run this and you'll just get a big number for really what the cumulative insulation is, the total cumulative, all over everything. So you have a very large number over there. Okay, let's go ahead and pause there because this is actually not bad so far. What's going to happen is we are next going to go through and say, great, if we can figure out what the total cumulative insulation is for a single slope. Let's go ahead and try it for all the different slopes and sort of see what we think is best. Now, as we're talking, what I'm realizing is that because as this thing gets greater and greater, you have more and more area. So that's contributing to the fact that we're getting more you know, kind of insulation out of it too. So we can go through and evaluate it a little bit differently. This is the total amount that's there. I'm trying to think, we might want to divide it by the area yeah, or something like that, so that we can actually uh, be a little fairer in the scheme of things. If I wanted to do that, let's kind of see what we could do. I think I have a surface area function. So I might be able to take that over here. Let me pass the surface down to it. And then if I wanted to be sort of fair about this, I guess I could take my kind of total over here and really divide that by the surface area. So I'll say total insulation divided by the surface area. And that might actually be a fairer evaluation. So now I have an insulation per area. And that's probably a fair number. Okay. I just had a surface area and I pulled it off the surface. So now we have a basically insulation per surface area. That's a little bit better. In the example I'm building, in the example of the files, I'm just doing the total insulation. But as we're going through, I'm realizing, hey, that's not really truly fair since we get more area as the thing gets sloped here and sloped here. So always watch out that for that, too. A lot of times you can construct an analysis that sort of gives you what appears to be a good answer, but then you have to back off and kind of think about the logic about why is it so good that I keep sloping it up higher and higher? I kept on getting more and more insulation. Okay, 
because my spidey sense says that shouldn't be true. I should actually do something where the angle is sort of about the same angle as the sun in the sky. So the more direct it is, that would feel a little bit better. So I think this will give us that result. But let's go ahead, pause, come on back in five, and we'll go through the last steps, which are really taking this evaluation, which is all kind of strung out all over the place, and say, you know, I like it. What if we could put it into a nice single node? And then just say, great, it has inputs, it has outputs, and we can evaluate a whole bunch of things with this node. But we did all the hard work. The next part's really easy. And then could we bring the, like, later down, we could make, just make a different node of the colors, too, and then open a new file, and then add both in, and then the colors will still run? It should be that we should be able to take the evaluate. Yeah, we should be able to get the colors to work. OK. OK. Actually, I think the best thing to do might be to go through it at the tail end, after we go through and figure out really what this is the optimal, it. do an yeah. optimal. Okay, so let's go ahead and pause there. Come on back in five, and we'll finish this up. Which one?